at its core why why do i believe in change so passionately it's fundamentally because organizations don't change it's the people who change now you probably heard that before and that probably sort of resonates in some way but i just want to talk you through this so this I, i've um, taking this from a blog written by Sophia, um, uh, there's links down there, you can uh, give that a Google search. And she fantastically puts this graphic in and references a book called Switch, in another book I would recommend reading. And it sort of talks about this is like your brain. So your brain is built up of lots of different components and you've got the, the rider and the elephant. Now, obviously, ethics aside of putting riders on top of elephants i think that this really helps in terms of an analogy to understand why sometimes change doesn't work if that elephant has trodden the the same path for for many years and it knows that the way it's going just like in the way that our workers may have known how to use their paper forms and they know how to do it they can almost muscle memory really kicks in and they can get going they know exactly what to do they're comfortable with doing it if the, the logical part of your brain, which is represented by the rider in the analogy, says, but this way is easier, you, you could go this path and it would be easier for you, unless the emotional part, which is represented by the elephant, unless that fundamentally believes in it, you're winning not only um, your mind, but the heart. So we often refer to winning round hearts and minds, and that's really what this is about. How do you win round the logical part of your brain and the emotional part? Because if your gut says, yeah, I actually want to do this in a better way, you will change the path that you're on. Um, and that's where change management comes in. So how did we approach it? Well, if you do a Google search, there are lots of different models. There's lots of different ways to approach change. And the thing is there's no one answer to it there's no magic sauce there's no a uh, single bullet that's going to say this is how you solve it it's a combination of things and that's what i want to to talk through we used a model of change by a company called ProSci. There's lots of different change models out there, whether it's Cotter's eight step model of change or Bridges transition model. There's so much content out there. I felt that this one resonated most because I really do think that it's very applicable to technology projects. The ADCAR model simply is an acronym that divides down it into awareness, desire, knowledge, ability, and reinforcement. Now, if you walk through those stages, theoretically, you then increase the chances that whatever new technology you're bringing in, whatever change you're making, is going to be more successful than had you not bothered doing anything. We've all seen projects that have happened. We see this great technology. You know, in fact, I was hearing stories that just you know last year, the year before, a, a service had bought in a whole load of tablets in the hope that they were going to do exactly what we were trying to do, but they've ended up in cupboards because people didn't believe in them. They didn't see the value of them. And that's why we needed to approach it differently. That was our challenge. You can be different with this, okay? You don't have to follow the same mistakes we've made before. Be bold, be brave with change. One of the things that often sort of gets mentioned to me is, but surely Ross changes just about a good communication plan. Surely if we just put a communications manager in, they would be able to craft some beautiful comms, really great wordsmithing, and that would engage people. I don't agree. It is more than communications. It's your developing skills. It's how do you going to manage resistance proactively? How do you celebrate successes so that people can see that it's working? In addition to that, so on the left-hand side of the slide, you'll see these are the different elements that made up our change management plan. That's a living, breathing document. I mean, you know, I'm actually quite reluctant to share it around because it's never really, uh, it's only a snapshot in time. You know, it's a document that we always refer back to and we make changes. Our communication plan, you know, I'm sure our program lead gets demented with me because I'm constantly changing it because we have to. We have to make it appropriate. We have to learn the lessons from what we've done before, make it better each time for every phase of our project. And also on the right hand side, you, you know, this is just a snapshot of our change impact assessment. So 
for all the different audiences, what's their current state, what's the future state, what's the gap, and what are we going to do about the gap? Because that's really important. You know, an area, it would be very easy for us just to distribute tablets and hope for the best. But what about that process for uh, joiners, movers, leavers? What do line managers need to know about the change in that process? What do they do when somebody moves on? We need to make sure we're tackling these gaps. So it's broader than the technology. Technology is a really core part of it, but it's all of the bits around it, which actually means that it's going to be more successful. This is the feedback cycle that I mentioned. So um, we really analysed all the different uh, user touch points, as I sort of described them. So if you start at the top, you've got all of our users. What were all the different interactions that they may have? And how would we then capture that? So we have one big list of all the feedback points that we gather. And then on a weekly basis, we have a feedback loop session as a project team where we go through all the feedback and all the actions but that's the important bit, we take action, we change how we do it, we say, okay, cool, so that's really interesting about how that communication um, landed. 